Welcome to NextGen Mentoring Forum. The NextGen Mentoring Forum series is to empower, educate, and illuminate individuals who are already in or interested in the financial planning industry. At each forum, an expert will discuss a topic in the field of financial planning with the purpose of inspiring critical thoughts and discussions. In today's session, we have the top investment expert, Jeremy Whitback, uh, going to talk about the year-end investment planning. My name is Dr. Jolly Jen. I am I'm the director of the financial planning at the California Lutheran University. I also maintain an active financial planning practice specializing in succession program management at Value Growth Institute. I've um, published three award-winning books, one more coming through hopefully spring in 2022. It's a, a great honor to have our top faculty, Jeremy, we back today. Jeremy is a partner at Polaris Wealth and a member of the business development team. Jeremy meets directly with clients um, and prospective clients to communicate Polaris uh, wealth investment strategies and preview all financial planning needs. Jeremy graduated from University of Arizona, where he earned his BS in accounting. Additionally, he is also a graduate from California Lutheran University, where he earned his MBA in financial planning. Jeremy has an extensive background in the financial service industry and holds the Charter Financial Analyst, or CFA, and he is also a certified financial planner, CFP. In his free time, Jeremy enjoys playing basketball and softball in the local leagues and spending time with his wife and children. He also teaches our investment planning right here in the graduate level at the university. So welcome, Jeremy. I know that we have quite a bit of material to go through today. Yeah, Kelly, really looking forward to our conversation today and talking about uh, some of the things that we can all be doing to better uh, plan on taxes and take advantage of some of the opportunities that uh, we have here in the uh, U.S. tax code. And so with that, uh, I want to start a discussion just by uh, going over a high level uh, review of some of the things that changed. And a lot of these are things that changed year over year. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, 2021 tax brackets and how you want to think about aligning your strategies to um, use the tax brackets um, to your benefit. We'll talk about the savings that are available in retirement accounts. And uh, this is an area that most people will be able to have the most impact on both trying to reduce your, uh, your taxes as well as uh, take advantage of some of the, uh, the vehicles that we have to save for retirement. And then uh, as a break off from that, although sometimes we get slumped together, we'll look at uh, high, uh, excuse me, health savings accounts and how we can use that as a uh, savings tool. Talk about some of the end of the year planning. So tax loss harvesting being a, a big one, how we can optimize the location of some of our assets for greater tax efficiency. And then lastly, uh, round out our conversation with uh, talking about how we can utilize charitable deductions and the impact that that can have on our taxes and some tax savings there. So let's, uh, with that, let's go ahead and uh, jump into some of the uh, major changes for this year. Obviously, the one that uh, changes year over year is always going to be the tax brackets. And so those are indexed with inflation. Um, in a moment, we'll go over the, uh, the tax brackets and where we fall. But that's really going to be a guide that will help us see whether or not we want to try to accelerate deductions or perhaps push them to a future year and so forth. And so we'll talk uh, a little bit more about that momentarily. Um, also, it should be noted that the tax code changed pretty significantly under uh, President Trump uh, when he was in office, where now we have a much more lucrative standard deduction. And so those were updated for 2021, where right now, um, as a single tax filer, um, the standard deduction is $12,550. Uh, so doubling that amount as a married couple, the standard deduction is now $25,100. And so what that means is that if you um, are thinking about itemizing, that your itemized uh, deductions would need to be in excess of 25,100 for that to make sense. And so for many people, especially now that uh, what's called SALT or state and local taxes are capped at $10,000, uh, $10, 
um, it uh, is much more difficult to get above those itemized deductions amounts unless you, of course, have a business or unless you make a lot of charitable uh, deductions. And then there were uh, some revisions to the child tax credits and child care independent uh, care tax credits that should be noted. And so if you're someone that has children or dependents that you're caring for, you'll want to make sure to uh, have a conversation with your CPA or a tax professional to make sure that you're taking full advantage of that. And if you're curious, that was uh, those were changes that were enacted or enacted with the American Rescue Plan. And then lastly, uh, there was a third stimulus check this year. So that was the amount of $1,400 plus $1,400 per each dependent. Um, and so hopefully everyone uh, that was eligible has received that check. If you didn't get a check, it may have been uh, that you had phased out. And so in order to receive any of those funds, you had to uh, make less than 80,000 per year as a single filer or 160,000 uh, per year or less as a uh, married filer. And so obviously in coastal states, uh, that tends to be uh, more problematic where our cost of living is higher. But if you were less than that, uh, make sure that you receive the funds that were uh, uh, distributed to you and uh, at the very least uh, make sure that if you did not correctly receive them that uh, you uh, look into that as you do your uh, taxes going into uh, tax season next year. Uh, now uh, as I alluded to earlier the tax brackets <clears throat> are updated every year and so here we can see our 2021 tax brackets and uh, so in the U.S. we follow a graduated scale um, with the premise being that the more money you make the more you can afford to pay in taxes and you'll notice that I put a, a nice little star next to 24%. And if you're curious why that's there, so as a planner, when we're looking at uh, strategies, what we try to do is we try to keep people in that 24% or lower tax bracket. And so oftentimes the question comes up, should I contribute to a Roth or should I contribute to an IRA account? And so if you are in anything less than the 24% tax bracket, so 10 to 22%, then you are better off using a Roth and Roth type strategies because you're in a very low tax bracket. Uh, historically, that is a very favorable tax bracket. And so you're better off locking in and securing that tax rate now and uh, not worrying about any tax increases um, or tax changes that occur in the future. If you're in the 24% tax bracket, um, that's where other factors will come in as to what the best approach is. And certainly, if you're higher than 24%, 32, 35, 37, it becomes a very simple um, answer uh, in that you want to defer um, any taxes and try to uh, recognize those taxes later, hopefully in retirement where you should be in a lower tax bracket. And so a lot of the planning, as you'll see, hinges around where you fall. And one of our uh, jobs as financial planners is to try to either accelerate income to take advantage of those lower tax brackets, in other words, to fill up those buckets, or to accelerate uh, expenses or defer income to drop us out of the 37, 35, and 32% tax bracket. So that is uh, often the tool that you'll see used to see where you fall and to see what we can do to try to uh, push us into one bucket versus another. Um, and so one of the effective ways that we can do that is by taking advantage of retirement accounts. And so one of the first things that everyone should be trying to do early on in their career is try to get to where you are maxing out your 401k contributions. Now, whether or not that should be a traditional or a Roth contribution depends on where you fall on that uh, tax bracket scale, as I was mentioning earlier. But every person should set their sights on maximizing that contribution and trying to get as close to or at the $19,500 level that they can. And just as a reminder, for those that are over the age of 50, you're allowed to do a catch-up provision, which means that you can put in a total of $26,000. This is one of the most effective means that we have to control our taxes. Um, it's a pretty significant amount that uh, can be deferred out to later years, if that makes sense for you. And then for certain people that are eligible, you also have the ability to do an IRA contribution. And so that level is still at 6,000 for 2021. And then once again, for those over the age of 50, there is a catch-up provision um, where you can do an additional $1,000, which means that you can do $7,000. Uh, and then one thing to note is that if you are working and you have what's called an employer-sponsored plan, so think of that being a 401k, um, 457, 403B, 
Um, you may be ineligible to make a Roth or a deductible IRA contribution. So once again, that's something to talk to your tax professional on just to make sure that you're eligible to make that. But just know if you're working for someone and you have an employer-sponsored plan, there are certain rules that apply that may or may not uh, allow you to contribute to an IRA um, in addition to your, uh, your employer-sponsored plan. Um, so Jeremy, I wanted to just make a quick point here regarding about the 401k, 403b, um, oftentimes that we also need to remind clients that as we move into 2022, the 401k goes up. That means that you do need to remember if you wanted to maximize it, you do want to remember also change a percentage of contribution, even though it is not a huge dollar amount. So 2022, the maximum is 20,500. If you're 50 and above, then you get to have 27,000. So those are the things that oftentimes just tiny little tweak of the percentage contribution to your uh, account. Uh, make sure that you do that right at the beginning of the year so then you can take advantage of that. The other thing that I would uh, say is that for some people, you may have multiple type of plans you can contribute. For example, if you work for the state of California, um, you may potentially have a 401k or potentially 457 plan. And 457 plan, you could also contribute the maximum, but without the uh, catch up provision in there. So, those are the things that I would definitely recommend people to look into uh, for those um, changes in percentage of the contribution. Yeah, those are, those are great reminders and things that are easy to forget about and kind of set your uh, contributions on autopilot. And come the end of the year, you realize that you did not maximize the, uh, the contributions that you could have made. So every January, I'd make a mental note that you want to see what the new limit is and then to make sure to adjust your contributions accordingly. Um, something else to that, let's say that we don't uh, have the ability to maximize our, our um, employer-sponsored plan contributions for one reason or another. Something else to think about is anytime you're given a raise, think about paying that raise into your retirement account. So if you get a 2% raise, um, you should strongly consider increasing your um, employer-sponsored plan contribution amount, like a 401k, 403b, 457, by that 2%. And that way it is helping to um, reach your longer-term retirement goals. And it's money that hopefully you won't miss since uh, you were living off of the uh, previous amount uh, prior to making that adjustment. All right, so this is actually uh, one of those uh, retirement, or I, could, I should say can be a retirement savings tool, although it's, uh, it's intended to be used for medical expenses that often gets overlooked. This is uh, one of the most advantageous accounts that are out there, and that is a B health savings account. And the reason why I say that will become more clear in just a moment. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with an HSA account or health savings account, this is an account that you are able to use and contribute towards if you have a high deductible health insurance plan. So there are special rules that surround what qualifies as a high deductible plan and um, all the insurers are aware of those rules and so they will make sure that those plans are conforming and they will uh, typically designate in the name that it is a high deductible health insurance plan. And the way that it works is that there are more out-of-pocket costs that are associated with these types of insurance plans. And that's where the uh, health savings account comes in, where you save money into that health savings account um, in lieu of uh, paying those funds towards a more expensive insurance plan. And so the way to think of it is that uh, you're on the hook for more of the expenses, but you're contributing that money into a health savings account and then you withdraw it uh, from that account as you incur those additional expenses. Where this can be really effective are, those, uh, are for those people that have very little in medical expenses every year and really only need the insurance to be a, a backstop if something major happens. And so rather than paying those funds towards insurance premiums where you uh, may not get much benefit from them, instead you can put it into this health savings account uh, which can grow for you and it remains your asset until you eventually use it. And the way this works is think of it similar to an IRA account where the contributions will grow tax deferred and the distributions are actually tax free um, if they are used for qualified medical expenses. And so the reason why I say that this is one of the best accounts out there is it's the only account that exists where you can put contributions into it tax deferred and take them out tax free. 
Um, every other type of account, when you put them in tax deferred, they eventually are taxed when they come out. So these are funds that you can truly put in there without ever paying any taxes on, once again, when they're used for qualified medical expenses. Let's say that you do this, you're very healthy, you don't use this money, and that when you are retired, let's say it grows to $100,000 or something substantial. Um, and you're never anticipating, don't uh, foresee that you're ever going to need it for, um, for your healthcare expenses. Well, the beauty of the health savings accounts is that you can also use these funds when you qualify for retirement. Now, it should be noted that if you use them for retirement, they will be taxed as ordinary income, just like any other IRA account. Um, but it can also be an additional savings vehicle for retirement. And so this is one of the best accounts that are out there. If given the choice between contributing towards an IRA or an HSA, and this assumes that you have the high deductible health insurance plan, you always want to fund the health savings account because of that uh, beneficial treatment when it's used for medical expenses. And so um, as of 2021, um, an individual can contribute $3,600 into an HSA plan or an HSA account rather. If you are a family or have a, your family on the high deductible insurance policy, and you can contribute $7,200. And then there is a $1,000 catch up for those individuals that are over the age of 55. And so this is an often overlooked area that can be a very uh, significant uh, financial asset for people, especially if you allow it to grow and uh, it compounds over the years, over the decades. So something that should not be overlooked, especially if you have uh, a smaller amount of medical expenses that uh, come up year to year. Well, one of the things that I would also kind of um, um, remind everyone is that sometimes this type of account, the if the account has a cumulative enough um, amount in there, sometimes the bank has a investment services. If you don't need that money, you could actually invest it. Um, so that's something that you might want to discuss with your advisors re regarding about that. One of the other things that I think that we use a, sa a health savings account a lot, not necessarily for medical, for dental. Dental oftentimes has a huge deductible, or even if you have any kind of dental work done, it can be quite expensive. So this is a nice area to definitely take advantage of. For 2022, the single um, contribution is $3,650, and for family is $7,300. Just tiny little bit of index, but um, it, it does still help. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And so, and that's a great reminder, just to make sure to keep up to date with those changes because come January 1st, um, they're all going to increase a little bit. All right, so let's talk about some of the, uh, the strategies that we can do within our portfolio and the big one being tax loss harvesting. And so if you're not familiar with tax loss harvesting, uh, what tax loss harvesting is, is it's the concept of trying to lock in your losers while leaving your winners tax deferred. And so the reason why this is an effective strategy, the way that our U.S. tax code works is that you only pay gains on securities once those gains are recognized, or you only get the benefit of losses once those gains are recognized. And so what that means is that if you have a security that you purchased, let's say you purchased it for $10,000 and it increases to $20,000, you do not owe any taxes on that $10,000 increase until you actually sell that security. Um, and so let's say that you do that. So you now have incurred a $10,000 loss. Well, what you can do as a tax strategy is try to see if there's any losses within your portfolio that you could recognize to help offset that. And so um, by doing that, you can effectively lower your tax bracket. And what we have listed up there are the long-term capital gains rates. Just know short-term capital gains rates go back to that uh, tax bracket that we went on earlier, but long-term capital gains adhere to this schedule here, where most people will likely find themselves in the 15% tax bracket. Um, if you're fortunate enough to make more than uh, 445,851 as a single taxpayer or 501,601 as a married uh, tax uh, filer, you'll find yourself in the 20% tax bracket. But once again, by offsetting those, uh, those gains with losses, um, it will effectively cancel out those, uh, those gains. The one thing to keep in mind with tax loss harvesting is that if you sell something, you cannot repurchase it within 30 days 
or you're going to trigger what's called a wash sell rule. And so what that means is that let's say that I have a security that has dropped in value. So I purchased it for 10,000 drops for 5,000. That's a horrible loss. But in this case, I'd have lost $5,000. I can't sell it and then buy it immediately back um, because that would trigger, uh, trigger a wash sell rule, which means that the loss would be deferred until I sell it again down the road. And so if you do this, make sure that you avoid repurchasing that security for more than 30 days, so 31 days or longer, and then that will ensure that you're able to take the loss. So, so let me ask you a question. So the example that you mentioned that, that you lost $5,000 in this case, and let's assume that you're not buying the security back within 30 days, uh, but um, in the slide, you have mentioned that there's a, a $3,000 you could potentially um, use against that that um, um, income, if you will. So that's say you have lost five thousand dollars. Can you carry over things that you cannot use this year? Yeah. So what that's referring to. So let's uh, let's kind of flip that example. Let's say that um, unfortunately I had a bad year in the market. My investments didn't work out. So I actually have more losses than I have gains. And let's say that now my net scenario when I look at all my gains and losses is I have a net $10,000 loss. And so um, what the tax code allows us to do is we can actually use uh, up to $3,000. So in this case, $3,000 would offset what's called ordinary income. Ordinary income means uh, earnings that you make through your employer. So your W-2 earnings. So if I made, say, $50,000 at my employer, I have $10,000 in losses. Well, I would be able to take $3,000 of those losses and offset um, some of that ordinary income. So my, uh, my W-2 income, so what I make from my employer would then be reduced down to $47,000. $7,000 of my short-term losses would then be carried forward to next year and future years to be used. And I could use $3,000 per year until it was used up or it would offset against any future gains that were recognized. Thank you. All right, so another thing that we can do that can be very effective is by being very purposeful about the location of assets that we hold within our portfolio. So there are certain types of securities that are very tax inefficient, um, some that are more tax efficient. And so the placement of those securities can have a pretty significant impact on the taxes that we pay year over year. And so within our taxable accounts, which once again, um, will recognize either the gains or also we have to pay taxes on any dividends and interest. And so in the taxable account, there is an incentive to hold things that don't pay a lot of income. So don't pay a lot of dividends, don't pay a lot of interest, um, also don't get sold a lot. So have a, a lower amount of turnover. So your passive index fund strategies tend to be much more favorable within a taxable account because index funds tend to be much longer held than, say, an individual stock. Because for there to be a motivation to sell an index fund, right, you would need the whole index to have a uh, negative outlook. As opposed to a stock, stocks go in and out of favor all the time. And so you'll notice a lot more turnover on a stock-based strategy or something that's more active versus your index. And so index fund strategies, once again, are ideally held in taxable accounts. Also, um, long-term capital gains are have a preferential tax treatment in a taxable account. The tax brackets were the, uh, the ones that we reviewed um, with the highest being 20% versus the 37% that we saw on the ordinary income uh, tax bracket slide. Also, your uh, dividend payers, especially your, uh, your qualified dividend payers, are attractive within a taxable account. And that may sound a little bit counterintuitive. I just mentioned that you don't want to have income paying securities. The reason why dividend paying stocks are attractive in a taxable account is because they have a preferential tax treatment where they're taxed at 15% when they're qualified. So that's very attractive within a taxable account. Also, direct real estate, when I say direct, I mean actually owning a building outright is very favorable in a tax, uh, taxable account. Why? Because you get to write off your expenses. So you get to write off your interest. You get to depreciate the property. You get to write off your taxes. And so that will all help to shelter the, um, the income that you generate from the real estate. And then lastly, um, if you're in those higher tax brackets, so if you're in the 35 37%, you should really consider uh, if tax-free bonds or municipal bonds make sense within the portfolio. So tax-free munis, um, tax-free, um, or I should say uh, uh, treasuries 
um, are priced at a level where they're intended um, the way that the market prices them uh, for those people that are in the 35, 37% tax bracket. And so if you're fortunate enough to be in one of those tax brackets, that may be a more appropriate uh, fixed income type holding. And once again, you should hold that within your taxable account, not within a tax deferred account. On the other end of the spectrum, so your tax deferred, like an IRA or a 401k, and your tax exempt, which would be a Roth account, um, are going to want to hold those that are not tax efficient securities. And so any active or high turnover fund or strategy is ideally suited within one of these types of accounts. Why? Because gains or losses that are recognized do not matter within these accounts. The only thing that matters is what you pull out of them. Once again, if you pull funds out of an IRA account, it's taxed as ordinary income. And then if you pull funds out of a Roth account, those are tax free. So that's why Roths can be a very desirable type of account. Also, any short term capital gains are, are ideally suited within these types of accounts, because once again, gains and losses recognized don't matter. It's just the funds that pull out. REITs are also uh, very favorable here. Why? Because they generate a lot of income, which unfortunately real estate income is taxed as ordinary income. Um, your taxable bonds, uh, so interest income is also ordinary income. And then lastly, your precious metals are ideally suited within these tax deferred accounts. And so one of the things that you'll want to do, especially if you have um, the ability to really control the assets within, uh, within these accounts is to optimize the location by trying to hold the securities that I have suggested on the taxable accounts in that account, and then also holding your less tax efficient, your higher turnover securities in your tax deferred or tax exempt account. And what that will do is that will give you the ability to what would have been paid as taxes to then uh, serve as a, a higher compound growth rate. So it will actually uh, accelerate the, uh, the growth of your assets and ultimately lead to a higher net worth um, once you need to uh, use those funds for whatever their purposes are. So quick questions here regarding about the direct real estate. So several clients that have um, California real estate, right? they are preparing for retirement, sell some real estate, move to, move to some other states, uh, but they still have um, real estate in California. So for those people who don't necessarily, and let's just assume those are all direct real estate rental rental properties. Um, for those people who don't necessarily need the money and don't want to pay for the current taxes, what would you recommend them to do in terms of the direct real estate ownership? Yeah, so I mean, there is one of the things that's very enticing and it's still available to this day. Um, we'll see if that changes because there are some proposals to have this go away, but it's something that's referred to as a 1031 exchange. And you can, so what a 1031 exchange is, is it allows you to exchange the real estate that you hold for a different piece of real estate. And when you do it correctly, it qualifies for future tax deferral. And so one of the things that uh, I will do with my clients is we will do a 1031 exchange on a piece of property that they hold, but they don't want to manage anymore. It's too much work or it's just not getting a, uh, the rate of return that they're looking for, or whatever the reason may be. And we'll, we'll 1031 exchange into something that's held in what's called a Delaware statutory trust. And what that is, is that the tax code allows for a portfolio of real estate to be housed in this Delaware statutory trust, and it fully qualifies for the 1031 exchange. And so that is a uh, portfolio offering that uh, my firm manages, and that, uh, we're not the only one, there's a lot of companies that do this, that uh, gives the person the ability to generate the rental income that they're looking for, but it's very hands-off, where they are, are no longer responsible for doing the, uh, the maintenance, the management, collecting the rents, and so forth. So that can be uh, a very attractive way to do it. You can also 1031 exchange into certain uh, REITs, um, just know that's a one time. And once you're in that reach, you're locked in that one forever. Um, uh, so that's different than the Del Delaware statutory trust where you can 1031 exchange that one again and again and again and indefinitely until uh, eventually you decide you don't want real estate anymore or until that person passes. Um, but if you're looking to do a REIT, you also can do a 1031 exchange into that REIT uh, if you meet certain criteria, which is a bit more involved. And so once again, talk to your financial professional, your, your CPA, your tax professional. Um, but those are two very attractive options that will give someone flexibility without recognizing all the gains, which can be very significant, especially on coastal real estate. Although, especially with the uh, run up the last couple of years, most places in the country have some pretty substantial uh, gains on the real estate. 
All right. And then lastly, um, we're going to wrap up our uh, conversation on charitable donations. And so charitable donations can be a very effective tax planning tool, especially if you're already so inclined. Um, it used to be that the only way that you would get the benefit of charitable donations from a tax uh, planning perspective is if you itemized. And so this was uh, one of those areas that was a bit of a bittersweet because the um, by taking the standard deduction, obviously it made taxes a lot more simple, but then it took away some of the incentive for people to donate to charities um, since you could not deduct your charitable deductions since they're an itemized deduction. There is a new above the law, uh, what's called an above the line deduction. In other words, um, it is on the first page of the tax return that allows you to deduct up to $300 of cash to a charity or $600 if you're a person that's married filing jointly. So even if you are um, not itemizing, so if you're taking the standard deduction, you will now benefit from uh, making a donation up to those dollar amounts. Now, um, there are some other ways that you can contribute to a charity that can have some significant tax benefits. If you are someone that's taking RMDs out of an IRA account and you don't need, don't want, it's gonna push you into a higher tax bracket. Um, so don't need, don't want the money. What you should consider if you're so charitably inclined is to make that RMD payment directly to the charity. So the way that that works is you do not take the receipt of the funds yourself, but you have your custodian cut a check or transfer the funds electronically directly to that charity. And what that does is that bypasses your tax return on the amount that goes to that charity. So if your RMD amount is required to be $5,000 and you donate that entire $5,000 to an amazing institution, say something like California Lutheran University, um, where they can put those funds uh, to, uh, uh, to work with the students that we work with, Right, that would then bypass your your tax return to where you would not see that increase your um, your income for the year. The other thing that you should consider. Can I, can I stop you just one moment sure. regarding other charities? Um, what if someone who is not ready doesn't necessarily know who they wanted to donate to? Are there other type of account that they could use? Treat it as a charitable deduction. Yeah, thank you, Jolly. So there is. And so there's what's referred to as a donor advice fund. And so what a donor advice fund is, is it's a fund that is set up specifically for charitable purposes without the requirements of you specifically identifying who that charity is going to be. And so the, be the beauty of a donor advice fund is that the funds go in there, you get the tax deduction in the year that you make that donation. However, you have future years uh, to decide how and when you're going to distribute those funds. And so the the advantage of using a donor advised fund is if you know that you're going to be making, say, charitable contributions over the next 10 years, but you're in a really high income tax year this year, consider making all 10 years worth of those donations this year, where you get the tax benefits on those higher tax brackets now, and then you can dole out the funds over the next 10 years or whatever your schedule is. Um, as you see fit. And so there's a lot that can be done there. In fact, a very underutilized tool, and thank you for bringing that up, uh, Jolly, that people can take advantage of to where you're um, able to uh, uh, put the funds as your conscience dictates, but also take advantage of some of the tax benefits that exist there. So there's a question in the chat box. Terry is asking that, um, can RMD go directly into donors or advisor fund? Well, um, I, I don't, thought you could. That I don't know the answer to that question. My my inclination would be to say yes, but I've never yeah. directly researched that. So I would I'm pretty certain that you can, but I would want to actually get a more definitive answer on that. But actually, I see Linda uh, just uh, right. answered the question. So, or actually, she's asking the question. I, I don't know the answer to that one. That's something that uh, I will have to research um, and see. So, so I the the, the th I don't know the answer, but I but I do know that donor advisor fund is treated as a public charity. So whatever the current limit would be, it will be still subject to that limit. Uh, but it, I think it was last year that you we don't have any limit. Last year was one hundred percent, right? So this year we're back to the public limits. So Linda is correct in terms of uh, treated that as a 60%. Um, so so Terry is saying that it's, it's supposed to go to 
for R&D purposes is supposed to go directly to the charity itself. Okay, so it sounds like when that answers the question, it cannot go to a donor advice fund. So, but yeah, once again, an excellent question. I've never made a contribution from an IRA to, or attempted to, to a donor advice fund. So it's not something I've researched, but um, it's a great thought, especially if you don't know where to place it. But unfortunately it sounds like then, at least based on the preliminary answers that that is not an option. So, but yes, that's a great uh, item to dig into deeper. Something else that should be considered, and this is true if you have uh, appreciated securities within your taxable accounts, is if you're charitably inclined, rather than making a cash contribution, which is uh, what I find that a lot of people default to, consider making a stock or an appreciated security donation to that charity. And the reason why that is such a benefit to uh, the person making that contribution is you get the full uh, donation amount for whatever the market value is of that security. So for example, if I bought something for $5,000 and it appreciated the $10,000 and I donate that security to the charity, I will get a charitable donation amount of that full $10,000 without having had to recognize the gain. So that $5,000 of gain, I will not pay taxes on. And the beauty of this, this donation is that since it's a 501c3 charity, when they sell out of that security to use for their purposes, they also will not pay taxes on that gain since they don't pay taxes. Um, and that's, uh, so that's one of the areas where that is a very um, tax incentivized way to make your donations. And it may be a bit uncomfortable at first if you've never done it before, but any larger charity is very familiar with how to do this. And they have step-by-step -step instructions to help uh, direct you on how to do this. And that is something that I would highly encourage um, everyone to look at and consider doing because of the major benefits in doing it that way. Okay, also- so quick, quick, quick notes in here before you move on to the next bullet point. That was um, recently, just in the last uh, two weeks or so, I was secretly hoping that Elon Musk selling his stocks was actually donating some into the charity because I could only imagine how much of a capital gain that he had as a founder of the company. But in the news, there's nothing talked about that he was doing that to, to any charity. Uh, but I just thought, well, he's probably got a very large team of advisor advising him, but it would have been very, very nice for him to do that because that will be tons and tons of capital gain uh, don't have to be recognized. Yeah, so, and in fact, that would have been a great way. I think in Elon Musk's uh, situation, I think he was trying to recognize the gain or the taxes because of the criticism that they don't pay their fair share of taxes. And so I think he went out of his way to pay taxes in this situation. Um, but in a normal world, yes, that would have been an, uh, a great way to do it because uh, the full amount of the donation would go to the charity as opposed to the net amount after taxes. And so it's a, it's a great uh, tool that we can use to direct our dollars where we would like to see them go. Uh, the other thing to note, and this is uh, especially relevant if you are in a high tax bracket or if you're uh, someone that takes a standard deduction, but perhaps you're close to getting to uh, the point where itemized deductions make sense. And that is consider making multiple years donations in one year. And so um, there's this uh, tendency to make the same donation every year, but um, perhaps what you do is you give them two or three years worth of donations in one year where you uh, push yourself into the itemized uh, tax uh, deduction um, levels and you can get the benefit of making that charitable donation or you know that you're in a high income tax bracket this year and you're going to drop next year. And so you make it this year where you are sheltering higher income level earnings. And then the next two years, uh, you don't make any donations since they got it earlier. And I have yet to find a charity that's going to complain about getting the funds sooner rather than having to wait the next year, the year thereafter to get those funds. And so that is a, an excellent way that you can also uh, try to um, benefit on the tax front as well as uh, donating to causes that, uh, that align with your beliefs. And the last bullet there we already talked about, which is the donor advised fund. So if you don't know where you want to go, um, but you know that you want to go to a, a qualified charity, the donor advised fund is a great tool, one that uh, I think people should use more. Um, it's uh, kind of forgotten about, but uh, an excellent vehicle that allows your funds to keep growing until you decide where you'd like them to go.
that we have uh, always nice to have tax attorney in this call today. So Haraj actually put it in the chat box saying that a QCD cannot go into donors advisor fund. So Haraj, would you, would you mind to quickly tell us what QCD is? I know most of us do, do know, but would you mind to quickly tell us what QCD is? Qualified charitable deduction. Yes. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Would you tell us what QCD is? PCB? No, just talking about your note. The qualified charitable deduction can't go to the DAF, the donor advice. Yeah. Fund. So the QCD is the direct donation that goes from an IRA to a qualified charity. And if that contribution or distribution out of the IRA is made before the owner of the IRA takes out an RMD distribution, it, it replaces the RMD. But if it's done the other way around, if the owner takes out an RMD first, and then later in the year decides to make a QCD, a qualified charitable distribution, then that does not replace the RMD and the owner is stuck reporting that RMD is taxable income. So is there a limit in terms of the QCD? Amount? In this case? Yeah, the amount. Yeah. 100,000. Is it per year or is it only per one year. time? Per, per year, year per, IRA, per IRA owner. Thank and you very much. It only applies for individuals who are, over, who are 70 and a half and over. Yeah, that didn't get moved to 72 with the RMD requirement changing? No. Okay. The QCD stayed at 70 and a half. I see. That's interesting. They didn't sync that up, but uh, probably an unintended uh, disconnect there. But perfect. Thank you so much for getting that. So there at you have point, it. So, our IRS will sync up at some point. <laughs> yeah. Well, so now that answers the question for those that are unclear. You cannot contribute your RMD to a donor advised fund and bypass it showing up on your tax return. So you need to go direct to the charity. Very good. Thank you so much for that. But then the yeah. QCD will be another. Uh, but you, if, you, you, if you're going to use a QCD, it has to be before you take in the RMD. So that, that's a, one of the minor things to remember. Yeah, it's in, it's in lieu of that. So you cannot receive the funds. So but Jolly, I wanted to thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to go over these items with everyone. And of course, if there's any other questions, more than happy to answer them. Yeah, so we have a couple of um, comments, not necessarily questions. So Linda is saying that um, crypto going into the donor advisor fund is very popular now. Um, Haraj also confirmed that donation to donor advisor fund is limited to 60% of the AGI um, and or for a cash donation. All right, so are there any additional questions from anyone from the audience today? I did see a question, Jolly, from Lynn, and that's asking if someone can contribute to a Roth IRA, but in October they get married um, and their joint income does not allow them to qualify, would they still be able to contribute uh, in that year since they were only married for two and a half months? And uh, so there's people that are more uh, capable of answering this question. Uh, so please let me know if I'm incorrect, but I think the answer is no. It's your, it's your status as of the end of that year, so December 31st. And so if they're ineligible, even for two and a half months out of that year, you cannot make that Roth contribution. I always will work with the uh, advisors ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, so you should have waited till January 1st to get married. I'm, right. I'm teasing. No, don't let that be the reason why you uh, delay getting married. But unfortunately, uh, just like if a baby is born on December 31st, you get the baby, uh, you get the benefit of that child as if it was born on January 1st, even though it was only alive for one day. So it's just December 31st, the cutoff. Yeah, my daughter was born on January 1st. I have to work oh. very hard for the entire year. <laughs> oh, one day too late. <laughs> All right, well, Jeremy, thank you so much for such a informative, informative session. Um, we're so glad to have all of you at the um, Next Gen Mentoring Forum. It's, it's incredible to just have a refresher uh, about all these um, tips and tricks regarding about your investment 
And I wanted to take a moment to thank um, California Lucent University School Management Financial Planning Program for sponsoring today's Next Gen Mentoring Forum. Now, California Lutheran University School of Management, we do offer MBA in financial planning that helps financial advisors pursue a leadership position or grow their financial planning practice by deploying advanced financial planning, effective client communication, financial counseling, and as well as streamlined practice management. If you know of someone or if you um, they might be interested or be benefit from the program, please ask them to sign up for our info session for more information. Our next info session happened to be in on Tuesday, January the 11th, 2022 at 2 p.m. Um, as we close out 2021, we have um, lined up some powerful financial experts in spring of 2022. So our next Next Gen Mentoring Forum session is on January 18th, 2022 at 2 p.m. Please join me to interview Dr. Kathleen Real. She is going to help us discuss how can you uh, or uh, any financial planners out there assist your clients to give it twice with a T crot. So you have to find out what they are. So stay tuned for that. And thank you all. And we, we will see you next time in the Next Gen Mentoring Forum. Be safe, be well, and happy holiday. So thank you.